Okay? So let me introduce you to Dr. Yala from the Wildlife Institute of India, uh, who is going to give us um, his, his analysis of the Indian uh, experience in translocations, which you will, see, you will see that is related to what you saw before about Africa. And I think, maybe I'm wrong, it's a country that didn't have much experience uh, 20 years ago, but it's getting traction quite fast. And I, I wouldn't be surprised that they, they, they overtake uh, Europe or North America soon. Uh, because when these things start moving, they, they, they grow fast. Please, Dr. Yala. Thank you, Ignacio. Um, and a very good morning. It's still morning, so very good morning to all of you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm really honored to be amongst esteemed people like yourselves uh, sitting in front of the audience. I'd like to just mention that I'm no expert on reintroductions. I'm a wildlife biologist, and I work for the government. So the Wildlife Institute of India is a, the technical arm of the Ministry of Environment, Forest, and Climate Change. We train managers in managing national parks. Uh, we also have a master's and a PhD program. And I do a lot of research, mostly on large carnivores and many other uh, aspects of wildlife biology. So it was a natural transition to use the scientific knowledge which I had as a wildlife biologist and use it for conservation. And one of them is translocations and conservation introductions. Uh, just a little bit of mention about how I met Ignacio, um, and it, it actually, I had forgotten about it till he jolted my memory that we had met up uh, in 2010 in a park in India where me and my team were trying to collar some tigers, and he and his colleagues from Argentina had visited, th three of them, young budding biologists, and uh, they could not get access to the park because the park was shut, the tourism ban was there, and they wanted to see some tigers. So luckily, over dinner, I had the park managers also sitting with me, and the three biologists came in. And uh, we had a nice conversation. And I think the trip was arranged at that point in time, and they managed to see the tigers in Ranthambor. So that is a long time ago, and I had actually forgotten until he talk, talked to me about it. So it's a wonderful coincidence. Uh, there's a very small world for people like ourselves, because there are very few of us. We need to network, help each other, and take the agenda of this planet further. With that said, I will uh, jump into the presentation and probably stand up and do that. Uh, just to bring in the statistics of India, uh, we have about 22 to 24% of our area, which is uh, wilderness area, forested area. But it is important to mention that these forests are not totally devoid of people. Many of the tribal communities depend on these forests for their livelihoods and their sustenance. We have protected areas uh, representing about 5.6% out of which about 2.6%, 1.2% are national parks. National parks are the highest level of conservation, where it is exclusively conservation with no people inside. We have about 1.36 billion people, about 464 people per square kilometer. It's one of the highest human densities. Of course, China has a larger population, but the human density is much higher in India because they're more concentrated in smaller space. We also have a very rapid economic growth. So to manage, maintain this high level of population density and have an economic growth, conservation often suffers. But despite this, India is home to over 3,000 of the world's tigers, 14,000 leopards, greater than 14,000 leopards. We are close to about 25,000 elephants, all coexisting with about 1.36 billion people with a GDP of about 1.85 trillion US dollars. It's a, it's a challenge but it is possible in India. And I'm going to try and explain to you how it is possible and how trans, you know, conservation translocations actually fit into the whole gamut of the national agenda to make all these three things work together. People prosperity, development, and conservation. The most critical element which differentiates India from the rest of the world is the culture and the religious reverence which people have towards all life forms. You heard of Mahatma Gandhi's Ahinsa, which is, you know, sort of non-violence towards all forms of life. This is not something which Gandhi developed. It is something inherent in the culture of India. So it is the human attitude shaped by religion. The religions of the East, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism, are very different in their attitude towards nature conservation than the Abrahamic religions of the West. The Western religions talk about dominion of nature, while the Eastern religions talk about custodianship. 
where people actually take charge of nature and make sure that nature thrives along with them. The first national parks, we attribute Yellowstone as the first national park in the world, about 1850, I think. But in India, protected areas were created about 250 BC by the Buddhist king Ashoka. So we had something known as Abhayaranyas, which were there in 250 BC. Now, just look at this picture here. It is about a monkey carrying a mountain. I think this was the first documented conservation translocation mythologically. Okay? This, is, this is a story in the Ramayana, which is, predates Christ. Uh, taking a mountain from the Himalayas, a peak of mountain, across the India and putting it in Sri Lanka, in the middle of Sri Lanka. This mountain actually exists in Sri Lanka called Ritigale. And the flora of that mountain has affinities to the Himalayan flora. So though it might be a mythological myth, but the fact does remain that people were aware in those days that there is similarity between the flora of this mountain in Sri Lanka with that of the Himalayas. And that is the first example of, <laughs> I would say, uh, uh, in the world probably of a conservation um, translocation. So we have almost an intact uh, array of ungulates. Okay? So it's a, it's a very diverse country because we have the confluence of the Indo-Malayan realm, the Palearctic realm and the Ethiopian realm along with the Indian fauna as well, which evolved while the Indian uh, subcontinent was drifting abroad uh, and collided with the subcontinent. So there are endemics as well as a lot of elements from everything. It's very, very diverse. We have these are our mega herbivores. Okay? So though we have not lost our ungulates, smaller ungulates, but we have lost three species of our mega, ungul I mean mega herbivores. That is the Banting, the Jawan, and the Sumatran rhino, which also ranged in the northeast parts of India. The rest of them are still there, the yak, the wild water buffalo, the gore, and the Banting. Oh, sorry, and the Mithun, which you see right here. This is a semi-feral uh, mixture between um, the gore and cattle but it is a free-ranging animal and uh, is often used by the local tribals for meat. We also have an intact carnivore, almost intact carnivore community with only one a large carnivore. So of course, we've got very small little carnivores, lots of them, I'm not going to mention this. The only element which is missing is the cheetah. And there's a huge ambitious uh, reintroduction project, transcontinental, probably for the first time for a large carnivore, which uh, Simon referred to. Uh, we're trying to bring back the cheetah into India, which we lost after India gained independence in 1952. So this has been in the offing, and I'll talk about this in a greater detail as we go ahead. Looking at a little bit of the history of uh, Indian conservation, uh, it was, even though we had a lot of you know, uh, reverence and all that, it was in the colonial era that there was a decimation of wildlife. So when India was under the British rule, um, bounties were given to actually kill wildlife for crop raiding measures, prevention of uh, dangerous beasts, killing people and that kind of stuff. And shikar was prevalent. We lost a lot of wildlife, especially across the distribution range of many of these species. It is only in the 1970s that modern conservation era began with Madam Gandhi uh, as the Prime Minister over here. She had a love for wildlife. She had the background for understanding what conservation meant. And she was influenced by a lot of our conservationists. Dr. Salim Ali, who was a renowned ornithologist. He worked with Delon Ripley uh, from the Smithsonian at that point in time. Mr. J.C. Daniel and Dr. Ranjit Singh, who drafted our first Wildlife Protection Act. This gentleman is still alive with us. And the Wildlife Protection Act was enacted in 1972. It is one of the most powerful legislations for conservation in the world. It has a lot of elements of the endangered wildlife uh, um, uh, uh, legislation of the US, but is much more stricter. And um, it, it forms the basic grounding of conservation in India. The first conservation project was Project Tiger, launched in 1973, uh, with seed grant of 1 million US dollars from WWF. The rest of it was Indian money. And we were very happy. We started off with nine tiger reserves at that point in time. And today, we have 52 tiger reserves. Okay? So it's been a huge transition. The idea of a tiger reserve is to use the legal system of protection, that is national parks, sanctuaries, and other categories of protected areas, put them together, and give them central assistance of funding so that the state governments can actually have more money to manage their resources. So this was fantastic. We were basking in the glory of tiger reserves. And many of my colleagues, my seniors, wrote papers on how to manage success. So once you're successful, what do you do? 
Meanwhile, our neighbor, China, was getting rich. And what do you do when you get rich? You flaunt your riches. And one of the ways you can flaunt your riches is to utilize parts and products of something which is most coveted. And wildlife parts and products are what is, you know, the most important, one of the elements of showing off your wealth in China. Wearing wildlife garments, using, eating wildlife, uh, you know, using it for traditional Chinese medicine. And China, you know, eradicated their populations, wildlife populations, their attention changed, to, uh, turned to Southeast Asia. And when poaching depleted those resources in Southeast Asia, their attention came to India. Though we had done away with a domestic market for our wildlife parts and products, we were not aware that poaching from transboundary was going to take a huge toll. So we had our tiger populations decimated in the early 80s, not knowing that that's what was, what was happening because we thought we had it all under control. It was only when there were two local extinctions which happened in the country in two very important tiger reserves close to Delhi, which is Sariska and Panna. Both these parks lost tigers to poaching. Okay? At that point in time, the media took to, you know, it was a hue and cry across the country and the prime minister appointed a tiger task force. Okay? And they came up with this document which is available on the net and it is the recipe of how to manage wildlife amongst poverty in a developing country with a high density of people where livelihoods are protected as well as conservation happens. So this is, if any of you want to ever deal with a situation like this, maybe in African countries where of course the human densities are much lower, but the poverty levels and the conflict levels are equal probably to India. And this is a very nice document to just download and have a look. So one of the things which the Tiger Task Force managed to tell us was that there was an institutional failure in conservation. Everything had failed. One of them was scientific monitoring. So we had, you know, we showed on paper that we had about 3,500 tigers in India, but there was no system for counting these tigers. So at that point in time, the government mandated me and my team to develop a technique of doing a nationwide survey for estimating tiger and other wildlife populations. And since then, we have been doing it since 2006. And as you can see, the official figure of tigers was to 3,500, but when we did the actual census on the ground, the estimate of the tiger population, we realized, of course, there are large standard errors on either side of this estimate, but it was less than half, about 1,400 tigers. This sent alarm bells across the country and a lot of policy changes. The Wildlife Protection Act was amended. And since then, new initiatives of protection and policy have resulted in a recovery of most of our biodiversity, including that of tigers. So you can see this increase in tiger population over the years, and uh, this has been a significant change in the attitude um, of the government as well as the public in looking at things. So one of these, these are surveys of huge magnitude. We have about 44,000 people working to collect this information. And you can see in these maps, each of these blue lines is actually a trail walked on the ground to estimate what is there, presence, absence surveys, occupancy-based surveys, okay? And, uh, you know, we got the Guinness Book of World Records as one of the largest wildlife, it, the largest wildlife survey uh, done so far. And the prime ministers, and all, all the ministers and prime ministers, which we had in earlier governments as well, right away from Madam Gandhi onwards, they've been all motivated for tiger conservation. And tiger acts as an umbrella. So if you have tigers, you have the entire spectrum of biodiversity in those forests. So this has been a huge, huge impetus because we have got the highest level of political support, very good resources, huge manpower to do this kind of work. So huge revolution. And India today is the leader in tiger conservation. So this is the tiger population of the world. And India has more than about 70% of the world's tigers today. And that's, that's a big achievement. We use a lot of technology and science and so on and so forth. I won't go into the details of how we do all this because that's a different thing altogether. The other success story has been the conservation of the Asiatic lion. Okay, so this was the distribution range of the lion, the Asiatic lion. Uh, in India, the historical range covered, you know, northern part of the uh, subcontinent. I, the lions never went to southern India or eastern India. So they had recently colonized uh, India when, of course, the tigers were also there. So I think the conflict did not allow the lions to colonize the rest of the country. But trophy killing eradicated this entire population and the only place left was in the small part here. I'll just go back. Okay. 
This spot is where the lions are today. This small little tuft here in the state of Gujarat known as the Gir Forest. And if you look at that peninsula, this Gir Forest is about 1,400 square kilometers. There were less than 50 lions left. And the kings, this is before India became independent, of that region called the Nawabs of Junagadh, protected the lions from hunting. And today, the lion population is close to about 700. Unfortunately, the protected area is a bit too small for 700 lions. Okay? And I'll come to that, what is happening there, because the lions are now occupying about 20,000 of landscape, like you see outside in Valencia. Okay? People, industries, agriculture, livestock, and lions. They're all mixed up together, and they live together in sort of harmony. But there are issues, and that's why we need to have a second population of lions, and I'll, I'll come back to that. So these are data from about 30 radio collared lions over here, which I'd, I've been researching lions for about 25 years now. And what you see is there's a huge mismatch within the size of a protected area. Of a protected area is on the average, which I mentioned in my first slide, about 250 square kilometers. Compare that to 20,000 square kilometers of Kruger, we are a drop in the ocean, all right? So we cannot have viable populations with a protected area-based conservation model. Impossible. You cannot have enough space for wildlife. So coexistence with humans becomes an essential strategy for conservation. And when you have large carnivores mixed with people, it's bound to cause conflicts. So conflict management is what most of our wildlife managers do, and how they do it is what we will talk about a little while later. So you can see the conflicts in this landscape are increasing. Protected areas are too small. Uh, livestock killing, attacks on humans on the rise. And the lions are living in an indo industrial, agro-pastoral landscape. You can see a huge shipping yard behind these lions here. Uh, we monitor lions on foot. Like you can see here, there's a real wild lion. And <laughs> the lions, as you we talked about the bears in Europe, uh, have been selected for over the years. And they're quite you know, non-hostile towards humans. It's very rarely that a lion will attack a human being. But they do attack. And these incidences of attacking are going up. Second concept, which is crucial for India, is because of the small reserves. When we saw that the tiger populations were getting extinct in isolated reserves, tiger reserves which had no connectivity, we were asked to come up with what is the ideal size of a tiger reserve. So we did a population simulation model using viability analysis. And we showed that for demographic viability of tigers, you need at least 20 breeding units in one place. It's like an insurance policy against extinction. And this 20 breeding units needs an area of about 800 to 1,000 square kilometers okay, inviolate space where people are not there, tigers are there, so that you have a high-density tiger population. So this got enacted as an amendment to the Wildlife Protection Act. The tiger reserve should be of this size. But how do you create space of that size with a density of 450 human beings per square kilometer? So this is, this is the model here. You have a core area which is devoid of people, which is about 800 square kilometers. And you have a buffer zone around the protected area of the core area, which is also a part of the tiger reserve, but is a multiple use area. So the revenues generated from the core through tourism and whatever else, the gate receipts are shared with the communities that live in the buffer zone. And this is a substantial amount of revenue. So the people would like to be a part of the tiger reserve. So that's an incentive-driven conservation model. And for that, you know, if you have something like this, which is an ideal tiger reserve, uh, you would have a population of anywhere between 75 to 100 tigers in this tiger reserve. And that by itself is demographically viable. To create that space, India is probably the only country which does relocation of humans by paying a huge sum of money as an incentive. Okay? There is a law which does not permit any eviction for conservation. So if, if there's a village inside a protected area, you cannot evict it. You cannot throw the people out. But you can give them an incentive if they want to move out voluntarily. Nobody can stop them either. So there's another act, which is called the Wildlife Protection Act, which offers an incentive of 20,000 US dollars okay, per adult in the family, a family unit, to move out. And that's a lot of money for a poor Indian. Okay? So you've got a huge queue of people waiting to move out of protected areas. It's a win-win situation, because the politicians are very happy. They get a huge vote bank, because the people are happy. 
And they, people are happy because they're moving outside from inside a forest where the crops are raided by ungulates, elephants, children are vulnerable to predation attack from large carnivores. Uh, they get to live, have access to marketplaces, hospitals, education, and you get space for biodiversity. So it's a win-win situation, and uh, I think we've done wonders in this incentivized voluntary relocation. A lot of amount of money is spent annually, close to about anywhere close to about 20, 000, uh, 20 million uh, euros annually on human relocation. Okay? So that's that's the major conservation initiative which India takes over. So wonderful, uh, we have these um, areas now. This is a picture of a satellite imagery of forested areas in central India. All right. So these red areas are tiger reserves, which you can see here, and looks fantastic because you have you know these large areas which meet the criteria of a tiger reserve over 1,000 square kilometers, and they're all connected with corridors. So there's genetic connectivity. So forests are connected. But as soon as you put infrastructure on it, you can see that it's a fragmented habitat. Right? So do these corridors actually function or not? Because you have demographically viable populations, but for genetically viable populations, the connectivity is an essential component. And what we've done is we've modeled these corridors across the landscape in India and made these available to the government for policy decision making. So any development project which comes into these corridors in linear infrastructure, roadways, railways, electricity, whatever else, has to go through the Ministry of Environment, Forests and Climate Change. It comes to us. We're supposed to comment on it, whether it should happen, not happen. If it's of national interest, you have to make it happen. Then there has to be a mitigation. And these mitigations, this is just to show that there is genetic connectivity. Mitigation measures, uh, this is the first um, overpass, underpass for animals, overpass for vehicles, built between a corridor, of, which was very important for tiger populations as a meta population to be done. So India started investing in these infrastructures, which is novel. We had never done this before. And this is going to ensure that despite these small populations and isolated populations, they'll remain connected. But many of these areas have lost the wildlife. So the translocations have to be a part of part and parcel to this. So coming to the history of translocations, I'll not spend too much time on this. I'll just go through these lists just to show you that translocations, not necessarily conservation translocations, but probably done for hunting and game uh, translocations started very early on. The first translocation was of African lions. Okay, they were brought into India by the Maharaja of Gwalior okay, on the advice for hunting. And lions had already gone off from this landscape. There were no lions here except here in Gujarat. So lions were introduced here. They increased in number. Um, it's believed that one of the lions, two of the lions were killed by tigers in this forest. And the rest of them had to be shot eventually. So this uh, conservation uh, translocation failed after about 20, 25 years. Till then the lions persisted. I don't think we should, we should see all the cases. Pardon? I don't think we should see all the cases. Yeah, because, sure. Because I'll just I'll go them. over them. Yeah, so uh, we can just skip these. Okay. So this is um, um, in the 1970s. In fact, the cheetah was there in India when India, the British left India and became independent. Okay. It, the cheetah, the last cheetah was shot in 1957, uh, but sightings of cheetah continued till late 1960s and the last sighting, which is quite authentic, was in early 1971. Okay. So the, the animal persisted in India. So during the reign of uh, Madam Gandhi, as she was the Prime Minister, and this gentleman, uh, Dr. Ranjit Singh, uh, was the Director of Wildlife Preservation in the Ministry, they decided to do a bold step and started talking with Iran. At that time, Iran had a good number of cheetah. Uh, to do an exchange. You take our Asiatic land and you give us the cheetah. And it was almost finalized when the revolution happened in Iran. And of course, that project just got shelved after that. So it was after a long time uh, that it came back again. And we'll, we'll talk about it a little while later. So that was the cheetah. A lot of other animals have also been translocated across India.
Okay, so I'll just go through these. Okay, now let's come to tigers. Right. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the case study of tiger uh, conservation translocations and talk about the failures and the successes and the causes that I believe are responsible for that to happen. So once these tigers were exterminated in these tiger reserves, the government of India decided that we need to do something about it. So we started doing conservation translocations. Uh, so th th this is one of the areas. In 2004, Sariska Tiger Reserve, very close to Delhi, uh, which lost its tigers in 2004 due to poaching. And in 20 2009, the Panna Tiger Reserve, where you had gone on elephant back and saw, seen tigers, uh, and, and in Ranthambore as well, uh, you had visited. So Sariska is a sort of a hard boundary reserve. Okay? We do not have fences. None of our reserves are fenced. Un well, fortunately or unfortunately, the way you want to call it. But there is no corridor connectivity with this tiger reserve to the so closest source population, which is Ranthambore. Right? So we did not expect natural colonization to happen. And uh, so therefore, we had to bring in um, artificially these animals. So the, there's a standard operating procedure. I'll come to that a little while later. Um, so the aim was to establish viable populations through a population viability analysis. We decided how many source animals, I mean the founder population should be brought in and what should be the actual number of carrying capacity based on a prey base assessment. And in, so the thing is to create space for uh, tigers by removing people out, giving them an incentive, moving them out. Not all villages take up this incentive. Many of them do. Then uh, replenishing the prey base. Um, they use, learned a lot from the South African uh, model, uh, BOMA technique of capturing animals, mass movement of animals have just started within the last 10 years in India, um, and intensive patrolling, foot patrolling, boots on the ground. So Sariska was repopulated um, from Ranthambore uh, with uh, uh, very few tigers. Okay? So the total number of tigers were brought in were um, nine tigers. And today, the population is of 18 individuals. If you look at the growth rate of the Sariska population, it's been very, very slow. The reason is being that the cubs were not born for a very long time in Sariska. And we believe that the human pressure in this tiger reserve was very intense. There was not a single space uh, of area where people didn't go inside this tiger reserve. So the tigers were highly stressed. And if you look at the stress hormones of these tigers compared to the two reintroduced populations, uh, highly stressed tigers in Sariska compared to that of Panna. And that is probably one of the reasons why breeding was uh, very late. And the breeding only commenced after three villages were relocated from out inside the reserve. And that, that might be one of the reasons why you need, you know, people and tigers don't mix very well, though they live together. But to have uh, a good source population, you need to have people free areas for large carnivore conservation. Well, um, may I ask a question? Please. I mean, you are you act, you act very, much, uh, very much as a biologist, okay? So you talk everything in biological terms. But then for, for most people, it must be quite puzzling why India decided to reintroduce tigers into areas that were small. I mean, I mean, for you in biological terms, it makes sense, but that's a political decision. Why, why did they take the chance of reintroducing Tigers. Why did the government decide to do that? And that's not a biological decision. No, that's no, a, that's a political about, decision. Of course. Why, why, did, why did the government took that risk? Um, see, modern India, there's a lot of uh, awareness about the environment. School education, public is aware of uh, environmental issues. Though elections in India are not based on environment. That's unfortunate. But there was a huge media outcry when we had extinctions of tigers in these two areas. So the government was forced into acknowledging that tigers are important and uh, we should do something about it. So it was the highest level of governance, the Prime Minister of India at that point in time, Dr. Manmohan Singh, who created a tiger task force to look into these issues. Okay. So, okay, the, so the, the government lost face uh, to the public because tigers went extinct in two areas. Um, and and they, it, so it was about prestige and, and, and showing that they were yes. able to... Okay. In, a, in a manner, yes, definitely, because, okay. uh, yes, you're right, it was a loss of face, not for the central government as such, but for the wildlife agencies. Okay. The wildlife agencies were saying that, you know, there are 19 tigers in the park, yeah. when in reality there were zero. So it was a very embarrassing situation for the wildlife agencies of the country at that point in time, because they did not have a scientific monitoring system. 
Um, and uh, that loss of face translated up the hierarchy. And uh, the prime minister really cracked the whip and uh, told them to do your job well, basically. And that's what led to that thing. That was a very relevant question. Thank you uh, for that. Um, so in Panna, um, which is the other area where we lost the tigers, we experimented. Okay, so there was a, well, one of the collared tigresses that I was working on, she was killed by another male while she was defending her cubs. And this researcher of mine who actually um, later on led the tiger conservation program for the WWF International, uh, Joseph Wetterkawan was doing his PhD research at that point in time in uh, Kana, and he realized that this tigress which was killed had three cubs who were just a few weeks old. So we rescued those cubs, which is normally what you don't do, but we rescued these cubs and we hand reared them. And as they grew older, um, we started isolating them and teaching them how to hunt. So a facility was created for these tigers where they could start hunting from chicken, then to buffalo, and then to natural ungulates like cheetal and sambar. And they became very efficient at hunting and the, you know, the, the, the touch with the humans was slowly removed. And we tried uh, convincing the government to use these tigers for reintroduction in Panna. Um, so there were wild tigers, wild to wild translocation, and two of these females which were hand reared were actually released in Panna. And they were extremely successful. No incidences of uh, uh, going close to humans. They were, you know, we had conditioned them, aversion conditioned them by scaring them with people, with fireworks and that kind of stuff. So they were afraid of people and they, now they're grandmothers. So they've littered and they have survived. The last female died a few, a couple of months ago. One is still alive, but they've contributed to the progeny. So rewilding of tigers was mastered in this place called Kanha and now it is there in about four different tiger reserves where these facilities are built in. And when you have orphan tigers uh, which lose their cubs, we actually hand rear them. And there's a mixed bag of success. Okay. Some tigers really take well to the wild, others don't. Um, and you have to bring these animals back. So they're all radio collared and released. And if animals go into villages or try to approach human habitation, these tigers are removed back. But now it's become a norm, and though many of these uh, rehabilitations have happened from orphaned uh, cubs. We also supplement cubs in the wild. So if the mother is killed and the cubs are young, they can't kill, uh, then they're supplemented by managers in one or two areas, and these tigers then grow up and later on learn to kill on their own, and they survive. So this has been uh, active management, as was mentioned, uh, with many of these areas, especially in reintroduced populations. Um, not in the other established populations, but just that has allowed these populations to build up much more rapidly. So Panna today has close to about 50 tigers from zero tigers. In 2009, there were no tigers. Now we have 50 tigers there. So um, they one of some of the reasons why Panna was successful, more successful compared to Sariska, was that uh, less human pressure, more intensive management, and good prey densities. Failures. Now, this is another tiger reserve very close to Ranthambor called Mukundra Tiger Reserve, recently declared as a tiger reserve. Look at the shape of it. It's a linear strip of forest. On both sides, there is human habitation. Okay, it actually forms a corridor connective habitat. Should not be a source population of tigers. Tigers can use it as a transient uh, passageway. But we introduced tigers here, and it was an utter failure. Okay? So they, we made an enclosure, a fenced enclosure of uh, 80 square kilometers, that is uh, 800 hectares. No. Yeah, 80 square kilometers, 800 hectares. And uh, put tigers inside it. The habitat selection for this enclosure was also not appropriate. It was more of a semi-arid cheetah habitat than a tiger habitat. Um, and uh, the tigers didn't do pretty well here. And currently, there's only one tiger left. Um, the rest have gone. So we're, we're trying to actually now move villages out of this park and make it more inviolate before we bring in more tigers. Uh, this place, Satkosia, is in Odisha. Um, it is a deciduous, uh, moist deciduous forest. And uh, here again, we, there was a single tiger left in this area. So we brought in two more tigers, one male, one female and one male. Unfortunately, the choice of the female was not appropriate and she made a human kill. Okay. Uh, that the male tiger was poisoned by the villagers. Um, the community was hostile towards the reintroduction. 
and this re reintroduction failed. The reason for that was that, uh, you know, consensus of the community was not obtained, a priori. So, I mean, nobody wants tigers in the neighborhood, yeah, especially if you don't have them. It's very difficult to get communities to totally agree to have tigers in 100%, but if they are made sensitive to the benefits which flow out of tigers in terms of economics, then they are tolerant towards tigers. The jobs which are created, the money that will be generated, the revenue sharing that will happen from great receipt, gate receipts, it works. But that was not done in this place. And uh, one of the tigers, as I told you, killed a human being. So uh, it was a, you know, the tiger had to be captured and put back in the zoo. So this was a big failure um, as well. So if you were to compare these sites, uh, Sariska, Panna, Mukundra, and Satkosia, we see that this, the founder populations are very, very, very small. So even though the government asks us to develop proper plans based on population viability analysis, the number of founders based on carrying capacity, the science is all there, but there is no glory in continuing supplementation. It's the first tigers which go in first two or three batches which get the media attention. So the park managers and the bureaucrats there is a reluctance to continue. The incentive is not there to do it. And that is a major impediment to doing scientific management of reintroductions, uh, yet still in our country. Hopefully it will change for the cheetah because, uh, well, we have some of us who are uh, heading that project here and we'll make sure that such an incidence doesn't happen. But the tigers, yes, so far there have been very few uh, animals which have been actually brought in. Okay. So that's, that doesn't work. You need to have at least about 15, 20 individuals to have a good genetic composition. So what we have done to rectify that, we've done a genetic analysis um, of tigers across the country. And there are about 156 individuals here from across India. And what you can see that the tiger population, each color represents a separate population. So you can see here that the tiger genetics, the structure in India, it's highly structured. And this could be for two reasons. One is human-induced drift, where populations have been isolated, or it could be natural vicariant events. So we have prioritized our tiger populations based on their vulnerability to extinction, that is the population size, the distinctiveness, and the diversity, genetic distinctiveness and diversity. If you do that, these two populations, which is the northeast population and the southern tiger populations, come out as the most important populations for targeting conservation efforts, investments, because they are rare, they're unique, and, you know, it's, it's distinctive populations. The most diverse populations are in central India, where all these tigers from across actually confluence here. So this is probably, well, it is the highest diversity of extant tigers genetically in the world. Okay, so that we have a management strategy of which tigers should be reintroduced where, okay, to make sure that if there were local adaptations, you don't mess them up. And this has come out as a form of a, a standard operating procedure by the National Tiger Conservation Authority, which tells you which, which sources should be used for repopulating what. There are, you know, this is very crucial because in some areas of the country, tiger populations are bursting at the seams. We've got more than what we can actually handle, and the conflict levels are going up, while in other areas, the populations are depopulate. So we'd have to move tigers into those areas by artificial means through conservation translocations. And this is the future of where these tigers should be moved to, you know, we've got 3,000 tigers, we have space for another 1,000, probably 1,500 tigers more, and that would be very good if we could do that through uh, conservation translocations in the country. Uh, I had to bring this up uh, <laughs> because it's a little controversial. Cambodia has lost its tigers. Yeah. Um, it was there in 2010, there were some tigers there um, at the St. Petersburg summit. Um, Cambodia declared that they had tigers, but now we know that there are none. So they want to do a reintroduction, WWF uh, International is funding it, and the source of tigers they're looking at is India. Okay? So they want to bring in tigers from India into Cambodia. Wonderful. Our politicians are very happy to do that. But should we be doing it? Because Thailand has a unique subspecies of tigers. Panthera tigris corbeti, which is much smaller. Malaysia has another subspecies of tigers, Panthera tigris jacksoni, which is also a much smaller tiger than the Indian tiger. IUCN has reclassified these tigers into only two subspecies, okay, which says the Sunda tigers in the islands 
and all mainland tigers, including the Siberian tiger, is now classified as one species, one subspecies. But we do know that genetically they're very different and morphologically they're very different. So if you were to bring in that Panthera tigris tigris into Cambodia and it's successful, then what is it going to do? It's going to outcompete these two subspecies which are critically, critically endangered. And this is where politics comes in and science sometimes support it by being lumpers or you know you can divide them into subspecies or put them back together on the same genetic evidence. So this is something which we need to think about when we use the IUCN guidelines uh, blindly. Um, they now become, as uh, some, one of my earlier speakers said, they become a stick more than an you know, instrument for helping us. They actually are very detrimental in many cases because the guidelines are made into policies. The IUCN never intended them to be policies, but the governments do implement them as policies. So if you do not follow the IUCN guidelines strictly, conservation translocations are not permitted. And you know, uh, meeting all those guidelines, I think for any conservation project with the best of science is impossible. So uh, I don't think any project can meet all the guidelines uh, as mentioned in the uh, IUCN guideline uh, book. Talking about lions, am I doing fine? Okay, <laughs> he doesn't like it. <laughs> okay, so uh, lion conservation or all the lions are in that one single population. Though we have 700 lions, currently they're suffering from canine distemper mortality. And as you know in Serengeti, uh, canine distemper wiped out one third of the lions in just three months. 3,000 lions, I think, were killed uh, in, in a in two months period. So if we have such mass mortality, our 700 lions would be decimated and uh, recovery would be very, very difficult. So instead of having all our eggs in one basket, the whole idea is to spread the risk and try to recolonize lost habitats in which lions existed. And you can see that there are several potential areas in India where lions could be reintroduced within the historical range. And these are some of them. Uh, this is the state of Gujarat where the lions are today over here. Uh, so the Gujarat government is very possessive of the lions. Okay? This, you know, the wildlife is a sort of a concomitant subject between the central, the federal government and the state government. The central government tells the state government what to do, funds things, but the state government is eventually in charge of what it can do. So here the state government doesn't want to give its lions anywhere outside of the boundary of the state. They believe they, they possess them. And due to that, um, uh, well, so we identified an area uh, in 1994, I'll go back here, um, over here, uh, Kuno National Park here in Madhya Pradesh, okay, very close to Ranthambore. Wonderful habitat, and we started restoring it. This was since 1994 till today, restorative ecology inputs in terms of habitat management, prey restoration, human removal uh, with incentives, all worked in, and we created a wonderful habitat and a national park for bringing in lions, okay? which is a habitat patch of about 6,500 square kilometers. The prey, which was very, very low, grew exponentially. And now there is a very high density of ungulates, close to about 50 ungulates per square kilometer. Fantastic habitat. There's leopard there, no tiger. The lion was to be brought in. And when that was going to happen, the Gujarat government refused to give the lions. Okay. And our prime minister, um, Mr. Narendra Modi, was at that point in time the chief minister of the state of Gujarat. So he was no, not the prime minister at that point in time. He was the chief minister of the state of Gujarat. He comes from the state where the lions come from. I come from the same state as well. So a um, lot of public opinion for and against, and there was a public interest litigation in the Supreme Court. And in 2013, the Supreme Court passed an order, a judgment, saying that the states need to do something which is in the best interest of the species based on science. There should be no ownership of any wildlife. It, it does not belong to any state. And that state can be in interpreted as a state within India or a state within the whole world. It's a fantastic judgment. But in the same judgment, it said that bringing in exotic cheetah from Africa was illegal. So when the lions were not coming into Kuno, and we knew that Gujarat was not going to give the lions, we thought that the habitat is ready, let us bring in a large carnivore, let us bring in cheetah here, because we'd put in a lot of investment. And this information to the court was, of course, given by some conservationists, okay, my colleagues, 
who, <laughs> who were probably propagandists of the tiger and the lion, but not the cheetah. So the cheetah got stopped, the lion got a green signal, and we are still waiting from 2013, and the Supreme Court ordered that within six months, the whole operation should be done and there should be lions in uh, Kuno at that point in time. This was in 2013 and now we are in 2022 and still awaiting the lions. Okay? So it took us uh, a long time of legal battle. Uh, the national government then filed a petition in the Supreme Court asking that the word illegal and exotic be removed from the wording of the cheetah. So we could actually bring in the cheetah to India from Africa because of course cheetahs were there, it's the same species, maybe a different subspecies, but our cheetah are now extinct, so we had to bring in animals from Africa. So it took us nine years before the Supreme Court heard our petition uh, and has given permission for bringing in the cheetah back to India. Unfortunately, even though the Supreme Court has ordered, the lions have yet to come to Kuno. Okay. Um, I think I'll skip these small translocations. Okay. So, so to summarize the, the thing about the lion, I mean, the, 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 there's only one population. The idea was to bring it to an area with, with habitat. The state stopped it, but then the Supreme Court uh, gave an order to say that it should be done. It should be done, and, but it's and, not done. OK. But it's going to be happening in the near future, as you said. Oops. Hey, well, just a second. I need to get okay. back to my presentation. Sorry, I lost you there. Yeah, so coming back to the lions. Uh, it's just to summarize. Yeah. 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 So okay. yeah, you summarized it well. So the lions have been, the Supreme Court has instructed the lions should go there, but the governments have not obliged. Okay. Okay. But someone put the cheetah thing in, inside, inside the same ruling, so to mix things and, and to have their own, their own agenda. So I'll okay. come to that in my conclusions okay. of how and why these things happen. And it okay. happens across the world. And many of my earlier speakers alluded to it. So I thought it is better to put it explicitly out that it's we conservationists, biologists, who actually scuttle programs for introductions more than the developers or you know, uh, even the politicians or the bureaucrats. So it's our colleagues, ourselves, out of egos <laughs> and okay. uh, probably misconceived ideas that what I say is true, once you've said something, it's difficult to say no to that, even though the scientific ev evidence might say something else. So we should leave our egos behind and see how conservation actually can progress by taking these bold decisions which Simon was taking about, uh, talking about and make sure that uh, good projects are not stopped by our misplaced uh, um, okay. uh, conservation ideology of either being too purist or not being too purist. Some middle ground is very important. And uh, most of the conservation projects are stopped by ourselves sitting here in the audience. Because my colleague is doing it, I'm not doing it, somebody else is doing it, kill it. And that's, that's it's, you know, it stops progress uh, towards conservation of the planet. And uh, this is the case with the cheetah, uh, okay. which you can see very clearly, which happened, it took us, the program went back by almost 10 years because some ill-placed conservationists thought that cheetah shouldn't come to India. Um, so we, yeah. you, you want to move to the bastard or? No, no, just, okay. uh, just if you don't mind. No, I no, no, time, no. Right? Oh, yeah. okay. Unless people are getting bored, I can switch over to something else. Um, I have a trick that we're going to use before the, the bastard. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, the swamp deer is another reintroduction, very crucial, um, critically endangered uh, uh, herbivore. Um, it lives, specialized to live in wetlands. But we have a population in central India, which is called the hard ground bara singa. Bara means 12 antler deer. It's got large number of tines. And this population was critically endangered. And the reason for that, um, oops, the animation's gone here. OK, so I'm um, sorry, there was animation here. You could see a wonderful picture of two tigers here and the herd of Barasinga. These animals are, you know, they have a tendency towards mobbing the predator. And they get killed very often by tigers. So in this heartland of Kanha Tiger Reserve, this population had dwindled to only 66 individuals. The reason was that this meadows where these swamp deer live were baited for tiger shows. So tourists used to come, this was in the early 60s and 70s, buffalo used to be tied, tiger would come and kill the buffalo and the tourists would be able to see them. And that increased the density of tigers in this area tremendously. Also there is an alternative prey, the cheetal, which also abounds in this area. So the two, you know, uh, a supplementary play uh, and high density of tigers reduce the population of Barasinga, selective predation on Barasinga. 
So as what we did was we created a fence, um, a fence like this, a predator-proof fence, put the barasinga inside it, and you can see the population growth in the fence after the predators were removed increased very nicely while this is the population outside the fence. So predation was responsible for that decline, and subsequently the population has now increased to about 750, and we have been using conservation translocations to create more populations of the barasinga in different parts of the hard ground, again using the BOMA technique uh, from South Africa. And we have introduced them in many of these areas in Satpura. And uh, rhino is another population which uh, is, again, limited, uh, limited by poaching. Do don't need to beleaguer that. The rhino horn of the Indian rhinoceros is equally valuable as the African rhino horn, uh, about 2,000 US dollars per gram of rhino horn. And that's a huge fortune. If you can kill an animal, you made your money for the next three generations. You don't need to do anything. So there's a huge incentive to kill and um, uh, rhinos. And uh, the rhinos are protected as shoot site orders uh, in Kaziranga over here, uh, which is the largest rhino population, close to about 3,000 individuals. 500 odd rhinos survive in many other small areas in uh, India. So we created a new population of rhinos in, Madhya, in Uttar Pradesh called Dudhwa National Park, where we brought in rhinos from Nepal and mix some rhinos from Assam. So trans uh, country uh, conservation project. And this was done. Uh, now we are planning to do a reintroduction in Corbett Tiger Reserve, which has also got an ideal uh, population. And this is a habitat uh, suitability model across the Tarai landscape, where rhinos can potentially be reintroduced. And uh, this is happening now. Hopefully, we should have more rhinoceros populations across the Tarai population, the Tarai landscape. All right. Uh, buffalo reintroductions, uh, the wild water buffalo, um, Bobellus arni, this is the gene pool for all ancestral buffalo, and probably the last wild gene pool left in the world. Highly economically important, um, but the populations are dwindling. Uh, we have got, again, a phenomenon. Buffaloes are wetland animals. Yeah. These are much larger buffaloes than what you saw in uh, yesterday's presentation of Europe. Uh, these are wild variety. It's not Bobellus bobellus, it's Bobellus arni, which you can see, uh, swamp buffalo. And um, massive, they can go up to th you know, 800 to 1,000 kilos. Uh, so this population in central India is only surviving in these two areas, in, in uh, Chhattisgarh state, in Indravati Tiger Reserve. And there's a militancy uh, out uh, group there, operating there. So it's very difficult to do conservation there. A uh, rebel group of militants operates in these forests here. So conservation of the buffalo has become very difficult. But we need to create some safety net populations because uh, these animals here in, uh, are getting hybridized with domestic buffaloes. For that reason, our scientists cloned this buffalo okay, um, from central India. So we got a female which was cloned, but unfortunately, the clone is not reproducing. So cloning, I believe, is a criminal waste. It's, uh, <laughs> it's trying to make belief that you can use science to do recreate animals. Of course, it doesn't have any genetic variability. Uh, it's great as an you know, artifact of showing off your science. But to reestablish populations through cloning, uh, I think it's going to take another 100 years before we can actually do that. Um, so uh, saving in situ animals, and secondly, through conservation breeding or conservation translocations is the norm. And I don't think we should waste money in doing conservation uh, cloning. Uh, the cheetah also, our scientists wanted to clone the cheetah uh, from the samples which we had, remnants of them. But again, that's a criminal waste. In fact, the central government was hoodwinked into creating an institution for cloning the cheetah. Okay? And a huge amount of money from the central government was spent in doing that, uh, creating that institution for cloning. They managed to clone the buffalo, though. Um, so whether we wanted to find out whether we could use buffalo from uh, Assam to repopulate um, at least supplement the surviving buffalo populations here. So for that, we did genetic analysis to see, and we found that you know, uh, there's not much genetic difference between the Assam buffaloes and the central Indian buffaloes. And that gives us a good uh, line of argument that we can actually bring in some of the buffaloes from northeast and populate these animals and save them from extinction. Okay, so. Uh, gore translocations has also been done. Um, this is the distribution of gore, um, again, one of the largest ancestors of domestic uh, cattle, uh, surviving, the only surviving wild ancestor in India uh, for the tropical cattle. You can see the hump and the dewlap. Um, these are the distribution maps. Um, earlier, these animals used to migrate. 
uh, the local migrations, altitudinal migrations with the monsoon and the, but now they're highly restricted in the moment, so they're isolated and many of these populations have become locally extinct. So the relocation was done from, in this area, uh, translocation from Kanha Tiger Reserve to Bandogar Tiger Reserve, again with the help of uh, South African vets who came and assisted us and taught the techniques to the Indians of how to do these mass uh, translocations. Boma technique as well as from darting from elephant back, uh, putting the animals in uh, cages and crates, specially designed trucks. Uh, we sent our um, biologists to South Africa to learn these techniques and design these vehicles and I think we had a very successful reintroduction. Now we have a population which is restored in this landscape and uh, they are there. You, you need to talk about Buster. I don't know if and you want to use the video. And cheetah is very important. And so I've got, make, I've got 15 minutes which is more than okay. enough, you know. Okay. Okay. So Thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah, we have this, uh, we've got three species, of, well, four species of bustards in India, and uh, they're all critically endangered. But this gentleman here, which you see, uh, we've got only about 130 individuals left in the wild. Okay, so it's critically endangered, and the most, uh, the threat to this bird, we, we didn't know this till recently, um, is power lines. So we did a, you know, we thought it was habitat loss and predation. Of course, habitat loss and predation are there, but the Achilles heel, which caused the mass mortality is the power lines. So if you map the advent of power in India and the extinction of this bird, you can see the high correlation in space. So I'm going to just ask um, the video? Ignacio okay. to actually show us the video here, and then we'll go ahead uh, with that. Bustards are one of the heaviest flying birds and they have no frontal vision. So when they fly, they do not expect barriers in the sky. And the modern power lines cause most of their deaths. As you can see, the bustard here has collided with the power line emanating from the windmills, which are the source of green energy. Considering the declining population of the Great Indian Bustard, the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change mandated the Wildlife Minister of India to commence a conservation breeding program as an insurance against total extinction of the bustard in the wild. We are going to take you through the conservation breeding facility set up at SAM in the Desert National Park, a collaboration between the government of Rajasthan and the Wildlife Institute of India and a temporary facility has a set up, been set up at the SAM dunes. The old guard quarters at SAM were transformed into a conservation breeding centre with the help of the International Fund for Hobara Conservation. Scientists from IFHC Abu Dhabi helped us in designing it and setting the conservation center up at SAM. The facility here includes an incubator for incubating eggs which are secured from the wild. Subsequently, there is a hatchering in which the, uh, the newborn chicks are kept, fed up to the age of about 10 months to about a year. The live feed facility is also maintained here. The area is made totally predator proof so that rodents or other carnivores like dogs and foxes cannot access the eggs or the chicks and we can rear them with utmost security. The process commences with the location of breeding females that are nesting and this requires a lot of field effort. Our field teams are well equipped. We had trained experts from IFHC who assisted our teams in locating females on nests. The regular movement of females within a localized area and a center homing place allows us to determine whether the female is nesting or is just wandering around on our foraging trips. So our team was able to locate several nests and with the permission of the government of Rajasthan, we were able to secure nine eggs this season and put them in the incubator for hatching. We have almost had a 100% success rate till now and there are seven chicks which are born and reared in the conservation breeding sector at some. Once the egg is collected, it is cleaned and weighed. Uh, the transportation from the nest site to the center is done in a vehicle in a chamber which does not allow any jerks to be given to the egg. Uh, once the egg is at the center, it is cleaned uh, antiseptically, then it is weighed and it is candled to find out the stage of development of the embryo. Uh, after that, it is put in an incubator. The incubator is maintained at a constant temperature and humidity in such a manner that the egg loses moisture at a predetermined rate uh, which is set for the Arabian Bustard standards 
by the International Fund for Hogara Foundation, who have been breeding these bustards for the last 20 years. Once the chick is ready to hatch, um, it starts pipping and um, you can hear the sounds as well as the movement of the eggs and it is moved to a different chamber allowing it to hatch. It takes anywhere from a few hours to almost a day for the chick to actually emerge when the shell is pipped. And the chick is hatched, it is left into a brooder allowing it to um, get over the strain of uh, hatching and uh, subsequently move to the hatchery where it is fed uh, with live feed as well as uh, staples which are developed for the Hobara Bustard with a high protein diet so its growth rate is maintained at the best uh, optimal standards. Regularly the chick is weighed and its uh, growth parameters recorded and uh, if it falls below or above the growth chart then its diet is adjusted accordingly. For exercise the chicks are allowed into a small uh, uh, open uh, sand pit where uh, till the age of about a week or so they exercise themselves and subsequently they are taken out. Since most of these birds are uh, long distance walkers, they need a lot of exercise for their limbs to develop well. And they are totally imprinted on humans since uh, this is the uh, founding population which will remain in captivity for their lifetimes and be used for breeding uh, purposes only. And the more habituated they are to humans, the easier it is to handle them for vaccination, for medication, for artificial insemination or for extraction of sperm and uh, uh, the process of habituation is by massaging the birds on a regular basis getting them trained to human presence and human handling and they imprint on humans quite easily as you can see in some of these videos the birds walking around with human beings as well as allowing close approach and handling this is just the first mile in a hundred mile race for uh, uh, the conservation breeding program and we have started with a very good uh, success rate but there are miles to go before we reach success because it will depend on how well these ch uh, chicks grow up whether they breed in captivity and once they breed whether we are able to rehabilitate the second generation born out of these chicks and train them to live back in the wild so it's a long drawn process and uh, we have to go in for a long haul uh, considering the project uh, to last for anywhere between 20 to 25 years uh, so that was uh, the conservation breeding. Now we've got about 18 birds and our first eggs have been laid since. Uh, of course, they're not fertile because the males mature much after the females. I have a question to all of you. Uh, if I go back to this map, I don't have a map here. We have remnant populations of two or three birds left scattered in India. Now the issue is these are all doomed to die. Uh, the question to you guys is, should we capture these birds and bring them into conservation breeding center? or just leave them there. So that's something, you know, because we don't know the technique. I mean, we might have a lot of losses uh, when we capture those birds and bring them back. But uh, that's something I'd like to discuss if anybody can give me advice on what can be done there. So we looked at the genetics of these birds and luckily for us, the population which is surviving is the most diverse and that's where our source population has been uh, drawn from. So we are fine there and these are the facilities and the current status of the birds is what you saw in the video. Now talking about the cheetah, uh, as you know, you may not know, the word cheetah is of Sanskrit origin. Cheetah means spotted, this cheetah is a spotted one. So it's ironical that the animal which has its name originating from India is now extinct in India and if you can see, historically, many of these countries are losing the cheetah population. So the idea of bringing in the cheetah in India is not just to bring in a charismatic animal, but to contribute towards the survival of the species within its historical range. This is a cave painting about 30,000 years old, where you can see a tribal hunter and a cheetah, a cheetah and its cub um, in Neolithic paintings of India. So the idea uh, is to have a functional restoration of a predator which was cursorial in nature. The tiger serves as an umbrella for the forest systems, but there are many areas in India which do not have tigers. There are wolves there, there's bustard there, but these two do not serve to garner resources for conservation as much as the cheetah would. Okay? So the whole idea is to bring in a cursorial predator which would do the genetic weeding of the weak, so on and so forth, and result as an umbrella for the conservation of the dry zones of India, the deciduous forests, the open forests, savanna systems of the country. So we had a meeting in 2009 of conservationists from across the world, 
cheetah biologists, IUCN reintroduction group, cat specialist group, everybody, who all, whoever was responsible was there. And uh, they mandated the Wildlife Institute of India to actually look at the feasibility, whether uh, me and my team, whether we could actually bring in cheetah, there was space to bring in cheetah in India, and what was required to do that. So we did an assessment way back at that point in time, and we found that there was space. And in 2009, after the Supreme Court gave its verdict that it is not possible to do it, so on and so forth, in 2020, we reinitiated the program. And this action plan is available if anybody of you are interested. You can just download it from the net. The idea is to establish viable cheetah metapopulation. So what Simon was talking about is the metapopulation in southern Africa, South Africa. We would like to extend that metapopulation across the continents, human managed in India as well. So this is, you know, we would take animals from South Africa, Namibia, and then exchange them once they are successful uh, with the populations there as well. There are several objectives, I won't read them out, but they are the general objectives, carbon sequestering, assisting ecosystems, uh, livelihood uh, enhancement, and bringing in a charismatic animal which acts as an umbrella. So this is the concept. If the cheetah was not there, I would not have got 35 million euros to do restoration ecology. Okay? So this drags such charismatic animals pull money. The government funds such projects. So there is the wolf, there is the bustard. We can't get resources for them. But if you bring in exotic something, you know, a novel idea to restore a historical, a cultural, a lost heritage, people rally with you. And even if the cheetah reintroduction, God forbid, fails, we would have restored ecosystems of all other elements which are totally degraded today. So this 35 million euros is for ecosystem restoration of some of these areas which I mentioned in, in the subsequent slides. So where do you bring these cheetah from? Ideally, we should bring the Asiatic cheetah. The only Asiatic cheetah population is in Iran. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier in the 1970s, we tried to do that. Today, there are less than 20 individuals left. The, actually, the publication says 12. Okay, but I give benefit of doubt, maybe close to 20. So it's impossible to source these animals. So actually, me and my colleague, we met up with the vice president of Iran a few years ago and asked him, would you give us some cheetah? He said, surely, India is a good friend. If you give cheetah to anybody, we'll give to India. But you give us lions. I said, in India itself, we are not getting lions from one state to the other, wherever I'm going to give you lions. But that was just, you know, it was, <laughs> I couldn't say that. But um, that's the reality. So they wanted the lions. We have got close to 700 lions. Yes, why not? If uh, the lions could be given to Iran, it would be fantastic to have the Asiatic lion range there, and they could do it. But currently, it's in a bad crisis, uh, economically, the country, as well as politically. And hopefully, these 12 cheetah might survive, might not survive. They might be totally genetically depopulated. Uh, they are not the right animals, even if we were to give them all 12 to do a reintroduction program. So our attention has to focus on southern Africa, uh, which is the ancestral population of all cheetah, because all cheetah originated from southern Africa, is the most genetically diverse, and it is a source which can sustain an offtake of about 35 to 40 individuals over a period of five years. As Simon already mentioned, that they are producing cheetah in a surplus manner in many of these game reserves. So we are depending on those as well as depending on Namibia to give us close to about 35, 40 animals over a period of five years. Now, if you look at the genetic diversification of cheetah, okay, um, if you look at these species here, the speciation is about a million years. It takes an animal to become a different species. Subspecies, again, about 75,000, 50,000 years ago. The differentiation between the cheetah subspecies is anywhere to the order of 11,000 to 12,000 years. It's the genetic difference between people in Spain and Germany. Okay? So it's, they're not different subspecies at all. And if you look at the genetic differences between different subspecies, they're all the same. So it really doesn't matter genetically if we were to bring in cheetah from Iran or from southern Africa in terms of cheetah genetics. There's not enough time for them to have evolved different strategies or survival abilities. So this is a population, I mean, a habitat model uh, from southern Africa projected onto India. And you see wonderful habitat. And it matches with the historical distribution of cheetah in India. So we have the habitat. And what we are now doing is um, these are different sites where uh, we can actually bring in the cheetah in, the, in these areas. 
and the different potential habitats where that 37 million euros are being used to do restorative ecology. Okay. So weed removal, uh, restoring native flora, native ungulates, stocking, restocking, so that the cheetah can be brought in. So the one of the areas is ready, that is Kuno Tiger Reserve, I mean Kuno National Park, which was ready for the lions. Uh, the lions have not yet come, so we're bringing in the cheetah there. Uh, I think S Simon is planning to visit there next month and see for himself how this area is. This area is about 700 uh, square kilometers, 750 square kilometers, devoid of humans, and the habitat where cheetah can actually ex expand and disperse is close to about um, uh, 6,500 uh, 6, square kilometers, this habitat patch, which would be available for the cheetah expansion eventually. And we're doing this not in one area, but at least four or five different areas which are being restored. Uh, and so we'd have a metapopulation and it'll be artificially managed because we don't have corridors where cheetah can move across. Okay. The prey base is excellent uh, in this place, Kuno. The rest are being uh, developed. And if you were to look at um, uh, the carrying capacity of these areas, we can currently support about 20 cheetah in Kuno. And once the outer areas are colonized, up to 40 individuals in that particular landscape. And about 20 to 40 in three or four populations is what we are planning to have in the years to come. So individually, populations are not likely to survive, but if you manage them as a metapopulation, yes, then the populations will persist over the long term. So these are our collaborators. Um, we, we can see um, we've set our um, collaborations going from Namibia, from Southern Africa, uh, University of uh, Pretoria, and the governments of South Africa and Namibia. And these are letters written by our ministers to the respective ministers of those countries. So it is at the highest level of uh, um, uh, political consonance that is happening. Delegations are visiting back and forth. And we hopefully should sign our memorandums of understanding between these countries. And we plan to bring in the cheetah within the next few months. Okay. So, the, well, if people who have been living with lions, tigers, and elephants, cheetah is very easy. Right? Because there's not a single recorded event of man-eating cheetah or you know, a cheetah which has attacked humans unprovoked. It is unlikely that we would have incidences of uh, human attacks of cheetah. So it's, it's an animal you can have in your environment, in your neighborhood, without much of a ado. So this is our mascot of the cheetah. And the chief minister of Madhya Pradesh has actually been promoting this mascot across uh, schools, communities, and the people are actually buying land outside of the reserve to start off resorts and ecotourism ventures. So the lion prices have shot up. The people are very happy that the animals are coming there. Uh, it's going to improve their livelihoods. Okay? Um, so the local communities are looking forward to getting the cheetah on their areas. We also have a good budget for paying compensation for livestock, which eventually get killed. And they will get killed by cheetah, small livestock uh, like sheep and goat. So, Last slide, with your permission, sir, of my lessons learned. This, this is the last should This is the last slide. I'm going to go to the last slide. Okay, but should I do something? Pardon? Should I do something? No. Okay. I'm just asking your permission. <laughs> just asking your permission. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Please, please, please go. Thank I'm you. sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I'm not sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, okay. So, I, um, political will is the essence of conservation. Um, so there's a window of opportunity when you have top leaders of your country, of your state, wanting to do something, grab it. It's like there's a tide in the affairs of men which taken at the flood lead on to fortune. As Julius Caesar said, we need to do that. The role of us as scientists, we believe that we are leading the whole program. I think it's a myth. Science plays only about 10 to 15 percent of the entire conservation, translocation, or conservation at all. Most of it is politics, bureaucracy, and community acceptance. If we achieve this, and we put good science into it, I think we would have done a fantastic job. Government officials can make or break a project. Okay? Always win them over. It's impossible to do any conservation anywhere in the world without government support. So you will get officers who are sensitive, and you will get officers who are not sensitive. It's our job as biologists to be communicative enough to convince the government, officials, bureaucrats, that this is good for the country, this is good for the people, this is good for the planet. And that's not a very tough job to do. Most people are receptive. But it's very important that they're on your side. 
Egos are huge. You need to rub them the right way, especially where bureaucrats are concerned. Resource commitments and sustenance, everybody talked about. You need a very important that they're long term. Uh, community attitude, it's, it's easier said than done. Uh, we talk about getting people to do it, and I agree with you. Very few communities will actually agree to reintroduction of carnivores. How much ever you might try to say that they're benign, they will have least problems, you have more problems of cattle dying due to weather compared to wolves, but yes, people will oppose the wolves even then. So it's, I believe that it's almost impossible to follow the IUCN guidelines here where community support is required. What you need is community's tolerance. Okay? You may not have 100% I mean, acceptance of your projects, but if you have tolerance, people are indifferent. They don't care whether you bring it or not. I think it's the time to do this work and uh, not wait for 100% acceptance because it's never going to come. Economic benefits help hugely. So if there are incentives of sharing gate revenues, uh, sharing jobs, creating jobs, this is the bottom line. The communities want to make a living, and if you can give them that bringing in carnivores, bringing in ungulates, or restoring ecosystems is going to improve their lifestyles and money, 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 then they are happy. So this is the bottom line of uh, uh, possibilities. Most often than not, IUCN guidelines are often used to stop delay good projects. Okay, they are guidelines. Mind you, IUCN never intended them to be policies. But the governments and the bureaucrats use them as you know, whipping canes. That you've not done this, you've not done this, you've not done this, your project cannot be done. But it's impossible to follow all of them. It's, it, it's not a single conservation project in the world probably has given a tick mark to all the conditions. Yet, successes are possible. So that's very crucial that you know, we need to work in trying to ex make this very clear that these are guidelines. And it would be wonderful if you could meet them. But if you can't meet them as well, conservation projects can succeed. This is the last one which I mentioned earlier. Most opposition to conservation translocations are from fellow conservationists or wildlife biologists, and not from developmental agencies, politicians, or communities. We need to introspect, leave our egos behind, support our colleagues who are doing good work, and encourage them to achieve objectives, not try to pull them down often, which happens. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Allah, and I apologize for putting pressure on all, all of you. Uh, I, mean, I, I mean, before going to lunch, I, I think I want to have a very short conversation with you because I think that's kind of an elephant on the room, I mean from the beginning, or a tiger on the room, uh, and, it, and it's, it's also related with the, with the title of this meeting. I mean, it was deliberately thought and said it was a meeting, not a congress, for translocation practitioners. And something that is coming out in, this, in all these talks is this tension between practitioners and, and academics. Uh, which, and you reflected, I mean, those lessons are amazing. I mean, the, 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 it's like what everybody knows who's a practitioner, but we seldom say, okay, because you usually don't have the room to say it. Yes, it's impossible to write that on a paper unless you have proof or whatever, and you, you don't write about it, okay? It's so, impolite to say that. Yeah, yeah, but we don't, we all know it, and, and we, you, you typically end up saying it, having beer after the Congress, which is actually what we're doing here. It's like a big beer meeting because it's not a Congress. So um, the thing is, there's this tension between practitioners and, and academics, I mean, and the tension is, 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 is being shared. I think it, what I want to ask you or share with you, I mean, I want to see your opinion is, you're probably the, probably the most academic of all the, all, all the speakers. And if I, see, if I see your presentation, it's very scientifically uh, structured, but then I see the lessons and they is, it's like they come from another world. It's, it's, it's like you have two personalities here. Right. I mean, it's like, I mean, so... so you got me there, yeah, uh, okay. <laughs> So my, I have two questions. One is how, how do you perceive this tension between academics and practitioners and how to manage it in reintroduction pro tax location projects, and uh, the two related is, could it be possible that in your <laughs> lifetime you've been through some kind of personal trip in which you were very academic and you end up, I mean, 
you were more and more involved into applying things like managing a buster facility, where you're probably you're responsible of what you do, not about giving recommendations to others, that you, there's been a change within you, like, okay, I don't see things the way I, I saw them 20 years ago, and I'm not so strict about how things should be done. So that, that, those yeah, are the two I think, questions. Uh, Ignacio, it's a very um, personal question, and I think it's very important as well. Because I, well, I'm an academician as well as a government servant. So I have the best of both the worlds. Uh, it's very rare that uh, academicians are employed by the government and mostly they're university scientists and so forth. The relationship which um, my institution has with the government is a very cordial and uh, formal relationship in the sense that most of the practitioners are trained by us. They go through as students through our institute. So you can actually dictate terms to them, you know. Um, they respect teachers and that kind of stuff. So this relationship has uh, given rise to these recommendations, which I was, I thought I should put them out there, but some of them are impolite actually. Nobody would talk to them in a conference, in a scientific conference. Uh, but I think uh, all of us are conservation practitioners and not scientists, uh, we're not meeting as scientists here. So it's important to put it out there, and these are, I think, the realities of the world. Um, and uh, they often hamper good conservation projects. Uh, it's through my experience uh, of working with practitioners. Practitioners can be of two types. One is the biologist practitioners, reserve managers. I'm talking here about the government bureaucrats who sit in an office, who probably don't know the realities of the world, but are going to sign on your file the permits which you need to transfer animals in Africa from one province to the other. I don't think those officials have ever looked at what logistics are required in putting an animal in a truck and taking it across, but they have the power to stop it. And they will experience that power to stop it just because it gives them a kick that I can stop something. Okay, you're sitting in an office all day long and all of a sudden you get the power to do something. <laughs> and that power may be negative, but is a very important human element uh, to show and feel good about yourself that I have the power to stop something. Okay, and that is very, very important for conservation projects because if they get stopped at that stage, then it takes years uh, to actually get them back online. And uh, they are the missing links of uh, successful conservation. Uh, about the white rhino was mentioned in the northern population. I think it's this kind of inertia uh, which has stopped certain, many, many important conservation projects from actually happening. The cheetah uh, in India, we would have done the reintroduction of the cheetah 10 years ago. Had that Supreme Court, that one line which was misconceived and contrived, uh, put in the judgment by some conservationists. Some conservationists used the opportunity to put it there. Put it there. So, okay. Through the Amacus Curie. Okay. Yeah. So these are issues which delay the recovery of the planet. And I think we all as uh, the warriors who are, who are the last Bastille on the survival of this planet, I think we need to take cognizance of these. Uh, we sometimes are ourselves guilty of doing it out of our own egos. Uh, because we stuck with a scientific idea we believe in. And there's a contradiction. My colleague says, no, you're wrong. And this is the way it should be done. And within your heart, no, you know that he's right. But... Uh, uh, it takes a lot of guts to admit that you're wrong. And I think we need to take that bold step and say, okay, I'm sorry, I was wrong, and you're right. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I think this is, this is the perfect uh, connection with the next talk that is going to be about Argentina. I'm sure the Argentinian team could, will sign all those lessons learned and we'll see it in after lunch.